Thank you so much for coming. This is a great crowd for a shop talk. We really appreciate it. Um, and I'll start at the end with Lucy. Lucy Shelley is an editor and writer based in New York City, where she works as the associate editor for Electric Literature's Recommended Reading. Um, her work has appeared in Vanity Fair, where she was on the magazine's editorial staff for three years, Esquire, Refinery29, and elsewhere in both print and online. She's originally from County Wicklow, Ireland, and received her BAs in English Literature and Journalism and Communications from UNC Chapel Hill. So, Lucy. Rachel Fertilizer, isn't it? Uh, she heads publishing outreach at Tumblr. Previously, she was the community manager at Bookish and the director of public programs at Housing Works Bookstore Cafe, where she now serves on the board of directors. She's also co-creator of Six Word Memoirs and co-editor of the New York Times bestseller, Not Quite What I Was Planning, and three other books. Uh, up next, Nicole Flip. A uh, writer and web editor who, in collaboration with her friend and colleague, Mallory, who we'll get to in a moment, founded the cult favorite women's humor site, The Toast. Her work has also appeared in The Hairpin, The All, The Morning News, and McSweeney's. She has a BA in English from Harvard and was born in Kingston, Ontario. And finally, Mallory Orberg is a writer and editor living in Oakland, California. She worked in publishing until 2013 when she and Nicole co-founded uh, The Toast and her first book, Text from Jane Eyre, spent a month on the New York Times bestseller list. I hope you read it. If not, you ought. Um, one last thing I want to say about these people. I was going to put this in your bio and I forgot. Uh, Nicole's mini hamburger recipe <laughs> is life-changing. <laughs> and I su suggest you go search for it on The Toast and then for your summer's grilling, it will make you very happy. That's all. Thank you. So what I'm hoping that each of our participants will do first is we'll start with Lucy and come right on down the line. Just say a few words about how you first got into publishing and how you ended up in the spot in publishing you are now and I guess why you've decided to end up where you are now. Because I think all everyone here is involved in new media publishing and independent ventures these are all people who kind of went off on their own at some point. I thought that would be interesting for our students who might be interested in publishing and writing. So, Lucy. I graduated from UNC and I moved to London and I was working at Esquire briefly there for a couple of months and then I moved to New York for the job at Vanity Fair. And I was, on, I was editing for the front of the book. Um, it wasn't a, a big team or anything, but we handled all of the shorter form culture pages. and. It was great, it was fun, but uh, I think one of my biggest takeaways from my three years there was that um, it was kind of a dying model of publishing, and I think people say that very casually, that like print is dying or that publishing, whatever, but, um, and that's not true necessarily, but there is definitely, um, you know, Vanity Fair was just very representative of a operation of publishing that was formed in the 90s and was very successful, but it was, you know, it, it's just not sustainable anymore. And so I quit that job in July, and at the time I did not have a job lined up afterwards, but I very consciously wanted to move into, I wanted to stay in publishing, I wanted to stay in editing. My passion was literature, um, and I was coming around to the idea that maybe I should try and make my passion my job as, as much as I could. Uh, so I just emailed Electric Literature. <laughs> and was like, I think you guys do really great work that basically represents where I think publishing is going and what I would like to do. And they were like, that's great. And then it was quiet for a while. <laughs> and um, then I, the organization was, just happened to be growing and the associate editor position opened up. So I applied and I just, I went through the application process and you see me here today, so it worked out in the end. But um, yeah, I think in terms of how I ended up here, I had like a very concentrated um, version of like the large trajectory that publishing has taken probably over the past 15 years in terms of the changes that are affecting the industry. And I, I guess in some ways I was lucky because I definitely saw firsthand from like a big name legacy brand that um, if they don't change a lot of their methods, then I don't know that those brands will be sustainable or see the success they have seen. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm a recent addition to the electric literature team, but I love it and hopefully all of you do too. Um, and it's again an exciting moment to be there because we actually just announced that we will be moving over to Medium and they've announced a publishing partners program, so it's not 
uh, they're trying to reposition themselves away from just being a blogging platform to actually being a, a publishing platform. Uh, one of the big reasons Electric Literature decided to move in that direction was because uh, the advertising setup that they had, like we're independent, we're a nonprofit, we just do not have the manpower to dedicate to advertising the way a bigger publication would. So um, that's sort of like built in. They've basically structured what you might get from a corporate publishing house if you were a corporate title. So that was our big news this week. Um, I encourage you to check out the site. Okay. <laughs> so that's my spiel. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm 10 years older than she is, which I feel like is relevant just when you look at sort of like the path and the narrative and the changes. Um, so I don't usually take it back this far, but since we're at college, um, I majored in psychology and I thought I wanted to be a research psychologist. And when I discovered I did not want to do that, um, people were like, that's okay, you can do marketing. And so I took a marketing class at Wharton and they brought back a woman, someday she's gonna find me. This woman who had been very successful marketing cream savers, like the life savers that are creamy. Wait, what? And <laughs> that's a thing. It was a thing, I don't know if it's still a thing. Point being that she was like very impressive and very successful, and I was like, wow, I cannot imagine caring if anyone buys cream savers. Um, and so I got a job in marketing for a theater company, because I figured I cared if people went to the theater. Um, and I ended up in Broadway PR, and that was kind of not good. And then um, when I was unemployed, all I wanted to do was go to bookstores and like hang out and use bookstores and drink coffee. It was the only thing to get out of my house. Did you stop flirting while I'm talking? <laughs> One of my readers came. Many of your readers came. Look at them. <laughs> um, and so, so then I started applying for jobs in publishing, and I applied on hotjobs.com, which um, dates me. And also I point out, because I think a lot of people think you can like only get a publishing job if you like went to Harvard or you know somebody, and I just applied on, not that there's anything wrong with going to Harvard, um, and I applied on hotjobs.com, and I went in for an editorial job, and they were like, your experience is in PR, and I was like, I'm 23, I don't have any experience, and so they, so they encouraged me to go into book PR, and they were like, you can make young people read, you can make books cool again, um, so I was in publishing PR for like three years, um, some things were great about it. I learned a ton about how Big Six Publishing works. I learned a ton about just like being in a big company and having like a water cooler and a cubicle and an HR department, which I actually like do think is really useful when you're trying to figure out how to make money in the future. Um, but I just was like not, it wasn't creative. People don't really want me to have like my own ideas. And you know, I was a kid, so fair enough. But um, you know, I'd be like, oh, we could do this. And people would be like, oh, we don't do that. Um, <laughs> I think that's a lot less true now. This is still 2004, 2005 I'm talking about. But anyway, so I left and I freelanced and I research assisted on Freakonomics, among other things. And I started volunteering at Housing Works Bookstore. Does anybody know Housing Works Bookstore? Oh my God, you guys. Okay, so, and then I was a volunteer at Housing Works Bookstore and like suddenly I was talking to people, like readers and like homeless people and junkies and um, a little bit of everybody. And it was so great, like it was, it was, you know, when I was in publishing publicity, which should be all about talking to people, you were kind of only talking to like producers and book reviewers and like, um, like the people who book the events at Barnes and Noble. But you weren't talking to readers and you weren't hearing back from readers and there was no ongoing conversation. And so that is totally not true anymore. But it was true when I quit. Um, so I loved being at Housing Works and I never wanted to leave. So I was there as a volunteer and then I became a part-time bookseller and then I became a full-time bookseller and then I became the director of public programs, um, which means I was running readings and panels and like we had like dance shows and film screenings and rock concerts and Ann Carson staged a dance play. Like we did all kinds of cool things in that bookstore. Um, and anyone who's ever worked in a nonprofit can probably guess what my marketing budget was. <laughs> so, um, I started using the internet because there were free tools to market my events on the internet. And so I like was not one of those kids who grew up on like live journal and whatever. Like I was not that internet-y, but I like had these amazing events in this bookstore and I had like readers I wanted to reach and no money. So it was a logical thing to do. Um, so we got on Twitter, we got on Tumblr, we got on, you know, all these things. Um, and actually it was Tumblr that made a huge difference for us. It was just like 
a place to find like other weirdos who are super fans of the same stuff we were and a place to sort of be like, we're a bookstore, we're an event space, we have rock concerts, we have comic books, we have a cafe, we lie down in front of City Hall and get arrested every time AIDS policy gets fucked up. Um, so there was like all this different stuff we were trying to combine. It was super successful for us and so I did that for a bunch of years and I kind of got known as someone who could take like old school stuff and make it work online. Like not with like big money advertising and hashtags, but just with like talking about books and talking about art and talking about music um, in these new ways. Uh, oh God, there's so much more. I'll slow it up, speed it up. Okay, uh, then I did the six word memoir books, which were um, a project that started at this blog that I was working on. And then it like, that was like in the like 2006 when they were like chasing after cool websites to do book deals. Not so true anymore. Um, but we did this book, and it had six, 800 contributors, something like that. And we um, got a contributor copy for everybody in the books and sort of included everybody. Um, so it was kind of like a big online community thing in physical books. So like everything I do is kind of like books and internet culture, shmush, shmush, shmush. Um, and so now I work at Tumblr, who knew me because I had started the first successful bookstore, Tumblr. Um, and my job there basically is to work with authors and booksellers and publishers and libraries and nonprofits and assorted other stakeholders in our community, universities sometimes, um, to sort of facilitate all these kinds of online communications. And so we have the Reblog Book Club, which is an online book club we can participate in from anywhere at any time. Um, and we have like all these interesting new ways for authors to reach audiences. Um, and I love it because it's, it is marketing and it is digital strategy and all this other stuff that I can't say without doing this, but it's just this very genuine thing of like taking books and writers and writing and bookstores and libraries and the people who will like those things and helping them find one another. Um, so I'm kind of like an internet literary matchmaker. The well, end. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, cool. sure. Hi guys. Um, so this is good. Okay, so um, I graduated uh, from Harvard in 2005 um, from the English department. Uh, I did a thesis on the uh, intersection between medieval and Renaissance English drama, which I could not talk about now if you paid me, but it was great. Um, being Canadian and having no money, I knew I wanted to stay uh, in the States, which is what we call this place. Um, but, and I knew I wanted to be uh, involved with books, ideally, but no publishing jobs will sponsor you for a visa. So I had to find a job that would sponsor me for a visa. So I went to work for a hedge fund. And so I was working for a hedge fund, and it was great. Um, and I was in a very touchy-feely human capacity at the hedge fund. I never touched the money, nothing like that. Um, and then uh, in I had gotten married to someone at the hedge fund, and in 2008, he said, I think the economy is going to collapse. We should leave New York. I think he's, you know, Bane was going to come and it was going to be like uh, Mad Max. It was going to be terrifying. Oh, I thought you meant Bane Consulting. <laughs> so we moved out to Utah um, and I started a Tumblr called Lazy Self-Indulgent Book Reviews where I just wrote about books and my life and mostly books. And uh, some people liked it and Rachel reblogged it a few times. Then people saw it. And then an editor named Edith Zimmerman at The Hairpin, um, which uh, some of you will be familiar with, uh, got in touch with me and said, do you want to edit the site for the summer uh, for like 100 bucks a day? And I said, sure. Um, so I started doing that. And I did that until 2013 uh, when my best friend here, Mallory Ortberg, and I decided to start the toast together, um, mostly on a whim. We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, and some, some idea. Some, some small idea what we were doing. <laughs> but what we said when we started was, let's do exactly what we want to do in terms of content, and then if people don't like it, we can change it then, but let's start out doing exactly what we want to do. And we really have not gravitated much from exactly what we want to do, and it's been pretty great. And now I'll talk. Um, I'm Mallory Ortberg. Uh, I also have a recipe that's on the website. It's not for tiny hamburgers. I've been thinking about it for the last few minutes. Um, <laughs> it's called Infinite Pudding, and I really recommend it. It's, it's for stress eating. Uh, which is very good for relieving stress. Um, and it's something that you eat when you want, more than anything else, to just have the hollow parts of your body packed with mass. <laughs> so that there's no room for feelings. It's like getting double teamed but with food. Um, 
So you get, you know Cozy Shack pudding? It's really good pudding, and you can get it pre-made at the store, and it's better than Jell-O, and you should, and it comes in a tub, and you want the tub. <laughs> you don't want the little guy. You want the tub. Um, and you also buy a package of um, shakeable whipped cream. Uh, and you eat the very top layer of the pudding as it is, and then you fill it, the little hole you've made with a crown of whipped cream. And it needs to be a crown. I mean, it needs to go up high. <laughs> And, and the, the, the ratio of each spoonful of, of pudding to whipped cream needs to be about four-fifths whipped cream. <laughs> it's just a, 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 a drizzle of pudding. And I know that sounds like the wrong ratio, but it's perfect. It's mostly air, and it's weirdly salty, and it just helps. All I can tell you is that it helps. And then every time you eat through the crown and another small layer of pudding, you shake up the can. So you should be, ideally, the can disappears at the same rate as the whole, you finish both is what you do. You eat, you eat all the pudding and all the whipped cream and, and the ratio is really important and at the end of it, if nothing else, you'll feel done. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes that's all you can ask from a day. So I just wanted to share that with all of you. Wait, what are you yeah, no, do your career at all? Um, um, really quickly, then, uh, or maybe not really quickly. I'll talk as, as much as I need to. Um, how long? How long do we have this room for, by the way? About an hour. Cool, great. Uh, so uh, I went to a college that I should not have gone to. Um, it was not an especially good school. It was not an especially good fit for me. And I sort of would periodically think about it and panic, and then decide to do nothing, which is. Um, not a great strategy, so I graduated with an English degree from a not very good school in suburban Los Angeles in 2009, uh, and I spent the next year and a half unemployed living in West Covina, California, mostly just refreshing Craigslist and crying. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's only recently become a significant place to some of us. Yeah, because of my crazy ex-girlfriend, which is a very good show. Um, okay, sorry. But I was sad there first, so... <laughs> And it turns out just aggressively and silently wanting a job does not often result in getting one. Uh, so I had to sell all my furniture and move back home with my parents, and that was a very strong motivator of I will take any job that, that will have me. So I picked up about four jobs. I was writing part-time at a website based in Marin. Uh, I was waiting tables at two different places, and I was writing free recaps of the Vampire Diaries for an entertainment website based in Washington, D.C. that I do not think exists any longer, uh, called Pactimal. Um If they do still exist, those recaps are probably still up there. Um, and, and, and I also worked part-time at a hyper-conservative think tank called the Hoover Institution. It is attached to Stanford, um, and it... I was very happy to have a job there, I can tell you that much. I would pass Christopher Hitchens on the stairs and just think, this is worth it. <laughs> I'm getting $8 an hour, that's all I need. Um, so I did that for about another year and made enough money to, to move into a studio under the overpass in San Jose, right by the, with the Winchester Mystery House, which probably none of you are familiar with. It's a great place. <laughs> um, okay. And then I got a job in academic publishing. Um, I, for Sam Gage, which publishes academic textbooks, which you guys are probably familiar with because we charge you way too much money to buy them. Um, and uh, I worked there for about three years. And like you were talking about, it was great to like have an office and go to an office and learn about that and um, have an HR department and all that. And I remember pretty vividly getting to a point where I would drive to work and think about what would happen if I drove into the median. Um, and that was when I started thinking, I think I might need to quit this job. And it's a much better problem than, this This is really dark. I didn't mean for things to get so dark. Um, uh, it was a much better problem, right, than slowly running out of money and lying in bed in West Covina. Um, but I just have this very intense sense of, if I don't do what it is that I really want to do, I don't think my life will have been worth it. Um, so that was where I was at. And I quit that job, and at this point I've been writing a little bit for, for money now at, at a couple of different websites, and I cobbled together enough money that I, I knew if I quit my job, I'd still have enough money to make rent and pay my bills. So I feel like the story of my career has been calculated risks. Never, I never jumped off of a ledge without a safety net, and I'm really glad, but I've also taken some risks that, so, so calculated, like I said. Um, so I 
was writing for a couple different websites. I worked at Yelp for two and a half weeks. I was the worst employee they've ever had. What's up? Uh, I was her, one of her references for Yelp. And at the end of the reference call, they said, is there anything else you'd like to know? And I said, well, Mallory's great. And if I ever start my own business, I'm going to hire her, so she'll quit right away. Um, and they said, oh, OK. Um, and that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, I took three days off my second week to go to LA because I'd already had a vacation planned, and my third week I quit to start the site with you um, because the money came through. So uh, then we started a website together, uh, and, and I also wrote a book, and um, I no longer cry looking at Craigslist or try to drive in the media. I never try. I'm a good driver. I should say that. I've never endangered. I don't endanger people on the road, uh, which is something that I recommend to all of you. Uh, and I have a job that I enjoy now. And your dear prudence. Oh, yes, and I'm also dear prudence now for Slate.com. <laughs> Wait, can I say one more thing while we're dark? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if we'd have this conversation. I'm a New Yorker, so it's different, but it's the same thing. I always tell people that if on your walk to work you start thinking about how if that car hit you, you could go to the hospital instead of your office, that's when you have to quit no matter what. So I, I think, think that's good pretty advice. universal, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's like the urban equivalent. Take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Just be good to yourself. Practice self-care. Yeah. I would like to ask you all a question. And I want to start with Mallory and Nicole. You guys, I believe, met in the comments section of the hairpin. And I think the we were talking earlier about why it was a good move for electric literature to move to medium. Um, but you guys have been saying that moving to medium wasn't really an option because the comments section isn't very good that the comment section of the toast is very important to the identity of the toast and the community of the toast. So I'm wondering if maybe first you guys, but then everyone could talk a little bit about the phenomenon in web publishing of getting instant feedback from readers and instant conversations about the stuff that you publish. Does it affect what you publish? And does it affect uh, how you kind of move forward with what you plan to do? Um, sure, I can take this because I'm the one who does most of the comment set up moderation building. Um, we have really nice readers. They're super, super great. And when I'd been at the hairpin, very occasionally someone would say something mean about something I wrote in the comments. And it occurred to me, I really wish I could just delete that so that no one else could read it. Um, and so when we started the toast, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to delete shit I don't like. But Nicole, what about the First Amendment? Doesn't apply to you. It's a blog. I am not the government. No, but so uh, we. What I've noticed, if you look at uh, commenting populations on websites, particularly women's websites, it's very, very common that uh, mostly everyone is pretty congenial. And then there'll be like one guy. And he like positions himself as, I'm, I'm the devil's advocate of the women's internet. Have you considered this? <laughs> and I just don't let that happen. Uh, <laughs> largely because what I've found happens, if you read Jezebel, which I, many of us do, I am sure. Um, and you, uh, you go down to the comments, which I always do. Uh, the most popular comment is up top. It's not really the most popular. It's the most replied to comment. And it's invariably someone being like, have you considered this as stupid? And then everyone else wastes their time explaining why they don't think it's stupid. And I figured if we don't allow that top comment to exist, maybe all the women on the website can spend their time talking about the things in it instead. Um, which is actually wildly successful, and people really enjoy it. And when you're in independent web publishing, uh, we pay all of our writers, um, which is great. Um, but when you can't offer people like you know five thousand dollars to write something, what you can promise them is we won't let people say messed up stuff about your work <laughs> on our site. And so I know for a fact that we've gotten some very like very difficult personal essays about some very personal topics that women have felt comfortable bringing to our website because they know that they're, people are not going to be permitted to say disgusting, slut-shaming, ridiculous things to them in the comments. So instead, things come into moderation, and we just delete them. And it's so much fun. Um, and uh, it, it, it's very fulfilling. But it's created, actually, a very beautiful little community. Like, our readers um, are just so great, and they're so funny. And they don't have to waste their emotional energy like getting into fights about things. If they get into fights with each other, usually we let it go on for a little bit. And we're like, this is leaving a place of civility. Yeah, I mean, it, it leaves room for actual disagreements from people who are actually invested in their positions. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, big time. 
So the way it stands is if you have developed a commenting account, like set up a little account for yourself in a name, your comments appear on the site automatically, and I've deleted maybe three comments in the course of the site from people with established accounts. If you don't, you come in through moderation, we see your comments, and then I've deleted people just because I didn't like their name. Yeah, frankly, because they're guests, and who cares? And that's the whole rest of the internet to talk about whole it. Rest of a lot of other places, online.com. Yep, no, anyway. Uh, and periodically, uh, in my link roundup every morning, I'll have a deleted comment of the day, <laughs> like two deleted comments of the day. And I was saying earlier to um, some of the students in the faculty, Lounge. That, you know, Nora Ephron said that great thing about, you know, you fall on a, you slip on a banana peel and you fall and people laugh at you, but if you tell people that you slipped on a banana peel, you get the laugh. And so, so much of her journalism was about just making that twist. And that's what deleted comment of the day is like. We're like, look at this loser. And it's great. <laughs> no regrets. Yeah, I've had an unusual experience, I think, with online commenting communities in that um, during the year and a half that I was very sad in West Covina, I discovered The All, which is a website founded by Corey Sika and Alice Bach, um, and it had just launched, and I was just enamored of it, and, and to me, it was like, this is what I should have done instead of my bad college. Um, it just felt like this collection of the smartest, most interesting people, and there was this very interesting commenting culture that was very, like let's all make a lot of really great jokes and sort of build on one another. So for like six months, I would just read it like a creep. Um, and then I was, I like finally started thinking, okay, what's my first joke gonna be? Like, I, can, I would like get up early, like, because obviously I had nothing to do. Um, and I would get up early and like, because they publish on East Coast time, and I would think like, okay, I'm ready, I'm gonna make a joke. Um, and like slowly but surely, like my jokes got some like, thumbs up or whatever, like, this is how I'll start my career. Uh, and weirdly it was, which is not career advice I can give anyone else, but then the hairpin came along and I was like, I'll make even more jokes here. And I did, and Nicole became the editor and I was like, I'm in the comments a lot, do you like me? And we would make a lot of jokes at one another and then eventually that turned into, I think maybe an email and you said, you know, come visit me in Utah. And I said, okay. Um, and then she bought me a plane ticket to go to Utah. Um, so the moral of the story is if you are unemployed, you can spend a lot of time commenting online and people will offer you jobs and places to stay. <laughs> and when someone on the internet offers you a plane ticket to a state you've never been to, Take just it. go. You know? <laughs> go for it. It felt good. I, I went with it. I, I trusted my gut. Um, and it worked out amazingly well. And, and we started spending a lot of time together. And, talking a lot about wouldn't it be amazing if we started a site together and then it started no wouldn't it be amazing if we started a site together um, and then we started a site together so that that's kind of my experience with commenting <laughs> i have stuff on commenting culture too if that's yeah, um because um for those of you who don't use tumblr a lot um, it is in a lot of ways a blogging platform but it doesn't really use comments unlike basically any other blogging platform out there and the reblog is really the sort of like unit of conversation. And so that means that when somebody posts something and I reblog it and respond to it, it becomes the top thing on rachelfirstlizer.com. So it's pretty rare that I'm gonna reblog something onto rachelfirstlizer.com just to be like, you're a fat fuck face. Um, <laughs> There's not like a drive-by commenting culture um, because generally you're doing something in your own space, you're doing it on your own blog, you're showing personal investment in it. I'm not saying there's like no negativity, but I would say compared to like pretty much any other large social platform, the atmosphere is a lot more positive. It seems like less than say like the abuse on Twitter. Oh my God, Ooh. so different. Um, and so, and similarly, like when you when there are people you reblog a lot, you you build these relationships because. You, you don't, you're not limited to a character count or anything. So like someone will write something and you'll reblog it onto your blog and sometimes people will respond, you know, with like 10,000 word essays. Um, and on the reblog book club, which is sort of designed for this, it's just cool because somebody can say what well, they thought of something a character did and then someone else reblogs it and it's like, oh no, but I hated when she did that because blah, blah, blah. And then someone else reblogs it and is like, no, but you were supposed to hate it. It's okay because you'll see on when it comes to the next chapter, you know, whatever. So those kinds of conversations are happening and I think it was very much designed that way on purpose. And when people look at it and like can't find comments, sometimes they're really frustrated by it. There are replies now, but that's sort of a separate thing. Um, but just, they're back, okay? <laughs> um, but I, I think that, but the, but the unit of Tumblr is very much about the reblog, and, and I think that's why it's helped so many writers find each other. Um, I've, I mean, I have a large following, but like I've reblogged writers and had them hear from three agents like the same day that I reblogged something by them. Um, so that kind of like quick communication is amazing. Um, and I think, you know, online in general, just being like a woman in tech, if I may, um, we talk a lot, right, about what your options are when you start something 
you can choose what kind of community you build to a lot of extents, and you can choose if you moderate comments or like how early on you incorporate a report abuse function and like how your product pushes your community. And I think that we're currently like having this moment where a lot of founders are like, I just built the thing. I don't know what you think I should have done. Um, and then a lot of people explaining that there's a lot they could have done. So I think that if you go into sort of like online writing jobs and like platform jobs, um, there's a lot to think about in terms of how to preempt these kinds of things and how to garden your online space. And yeah. Can I um, ask Lucy about Electric Lit? I feel yeah. that Electric Lit's model is a little different from what we've been talking about so far. It's part of its mission, I think, is to adapt itself to whatever new web technologies will help right. move it forward. So do you want to talk a little bit about the switch to Medium and what EL's mission is at the moment? Yeah, the principal reason that we moved over was because our central mission, the central part of our mission is just to be adaptable and adjust to new technologies and be not responsive but proactive on where we see digital publishing going. Um, I also think, I do want to say that I think commenting doesn't necessarily have the same bearing for electric literature than it might for the toast because the nature of our content is quite different, mm -hmm. particularly for recommended reading. And just to clarify, um, Recommended reading is one of the magazines of electric literature. It's the fiction section, and actually John's magazine, Okie Panky, is another. Um, so comments for us wouldn't really affect our experience in quite the same way. I mean, mostly it's, I think, where you really see the kind of engagement online that affects a website like electric literature would be Twitter, because that's where people just like, they gain prominence in the wider literature conversation and that's where we would notice them. So like if we publish a book review and there's a bunch of comments about it, well, you're reviewing a review in a sense. Whereas like if you were to, you know, start your own blog or like you are active on Twitter, that's where somewhere something like electric literature would know you. And absolutely we have reached out to people who, uh, or they have reached out to us and we have, it has led to partnerships, um, hiring, like jobs, all that kind of thing. So I just think it happens, it comes from different avenues, but of course, you know, like the online discussion is hugely important to us. Can I um, ask you guys to interrogate the idea that, of course, we're hearing a lot of, of quitting your job and doing the thing that you have a passion for, which I think we all want to do, especially when we're in the arts in some way. And I know a lot of you, Cornell, especially undergraduates, your folks are paying for expensive college or you're going into debt to come to school here and you want to think that you have a path in life. Um, how difficult was it for you guys to choose an alternate path? What were some of the challenges you faced as you made your way toward that goal? Or was it even a goal? Was it more serendipitous? I love saying serendipitous. It makes me feel smart. <laughs> And uh, I, I, that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately um, because I think often it'll get framed as you are either following your dreams or you are at a dead end desk job that you hate. And there's nothing in between those two things. Those are your only two options. So you either have to you know, leap off into the unknown and things are great or play it safe and, and have a desk job. And I think there's been times in my career where I've been really lucky, where I've been able to take a risk. Um, but those are risks that I won't always be able to take. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for being able to live, to be able to live. Um, all the pudding you want. All the, or some of the pudding. Um, and I think especially as a founder of something, it can be very easy for, for me to say and to kind of buy into the sort of like TED talk, it's great, follow your dreams, it'll work out. And then I think, oh, well, you know, we, you know, I, I lived in a studio apartment with no windows for the first two years. I didn't have health insurance for the first two years. I don't recommend that. Um, that's not something I would ever want to ask of an employee. That's not something I could have done if I had people financially dependent upon me or if I had a chronic health condition that's not doable for a lot of people. Um, and if, if we had had to quit the toast and I had had to go back to publishing, I would have just found another way to to write in such a way that I no longer felt very, very distressed. Um, and, and I think that there are ways that you can, sometimes it feels like if you're not doing something 100%, it doesn't count. Um, and I think there are ways that you can build towards something that's meaningful while also not risking your health or your well-being or your financial security 
that's really important. And I think it's really important to look for what's the next right step, not how do I get to what I want right now. Um, if, if, if that makes any sense, I think that's yeah. sort of how I feel about it. Before I started working at Vanity Fair, that kind of was, I saw that as an end point. It right. was like, I was like. Yeah, I'm sure it helped you. It, it, it's, there's a difference between quitting a job at Vanity Fair right. and quitting a job at some place that's not Vanity Fair. So that helps right. you to begin with. Yeah. Um, so I, I had kind of learned at that point that it, it's wrong to go at it with the approach that like the next step is like the step or like that's the big picture because it's not. I think that's something that's going to constantly evolve. So as soon as I was kind of able to make that mental shift, I think being a freelancer, like it's not easy and like I also did not have health insurance for a period, but um, I really strongly encourage don't all of you do to get that. health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> it's very good. Well also when, when I was younger you couldn't stay on your parents' insurance until you were twenty six. You could only stay on your parents' insurance until you were done with years. college. Yeah, I don't recommend that. And I have it now. I have it. I just paid my, my blue cross bill like <laughs> yesterday before I got here and I'm very glad I have it. Um, that was not a good choice on my part. That was a, a risk that I run, ran that could have gone very, very badly, um, and it's bad. And it's whatever. Everyone has a very different situation. Like, obviously, we don't even need to get into the whole thing, but it's like tiny little things. Like, I had $700 rent in Soho in Manhattan when I started volunteering at Housing Works. Mm -hmm. Six floor walk up, three bedrooms, no living room, shared with two other girls, but still. Um, so that, like, and I lived there until I was 30. And, like, so that enabled a lot of stuff. Um, housing Works, because it's a, it's not really a bookstore, it's really a large healthcare nonprofit, gives you full benefits if you work 20 hours a week or something. So I was, like, the only part-time bookseller in the universe with good health care. Um, you know, so, like, things work out. But I will also point out, like, I get asked to do a lot of panels about unconventional careers, and, like, yes, my path has been somewhat unconventional, but, like, I work for Yahoo!, like, I mean, I work for Tumblr, Yahoo bought Tumblr. I got some money when that happened. Not like a stunning amount, but, um, and like I get a paycheck every two weeks with taxes withheld and insurance and I go to an office and they cover my meals and this manicure. Like, I just like, I want to- Manicure is to Tumblr? Massages, oh yeah, tech is fucked up. Um, <laughs> I mean, and like whatever, and we could talk about all the things about tech that are like not a comfortable place for a bookish person, and all the things that are amazing, because like most jobs, there are wonderful things about it and less wonderful things about it. Um, but I think that a lot of people discount, in fact, I have this fight with my husband sometimes, like you're not like either an artist or a person with a job, right? And I think that like what a lot of people I know, and all my friends work in publishing, but like a lot of people I know, like the job is the thing. Like for me, like... I want to be a person who like builds bookish communities online and in person and like that's what I'm doing and that's what I want to be doing and like it's okay that I'm like not trying to get a book of poetry published like this is my thing and I get paid to do my thing and that's really lucky and awesome. Two other things that I feel like are important to talk about here one of which is when you have a job that's also your passion something you don't always realize is that you will drive yourself to the point of complete collapse. Um, in a way that you will not do if you have a job that you just see as your job. When I had a job in publishing that I just thought of as how I made my money, I was really good at leaving at 5 o'clock. Um, and I was really good at calling in sick if I wasn't feeling well. And I was really good at when I go home, I don't check my work email. Because it was just my job. And now, you know, we're coming up on the third year anniversary of the toast, and we start to have really frank conversations of, like, we're not burned out, but, like, I see it. I see it coming. Um, I mean, I took a week of vacation in our first two years. Um, and I've written, at this point, close to 1,900 posts. Um, and it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and I, you know, both Nicole and I treat ourselves in ways that we would not treat employees. And that's something that we're kind of having to come to terms with. If part of being a startup means that you have to devote yourself to 70 to 90 hour work weeks, at a certain point, your physical human body will say, no, thank you. Um, and that's very real. That's very significant. And the other thing I think is, you know, this is the first year of my life that I have made more than $50,000. And it's really easy, which is not, my God, like, it's good money. But it's just, it's something I'm dealing with the first time. And I have a tendency with money to think, whatever's happening right now, that's going to be the course now. So I, I can have, I can think, like, this is just it. I'll have multiple streams of income. I'll have a job here, a job there, and a book, and some stuff. And I'll just constantly make more money as opposed to, this is a flush year. I don't know that next year will look like this. Pretty sure four years from now it won't look like this. And it can be really easy for me to think, this is my new bar, 
I'm going to clear it every year. I'm going to always be making this much money or more. And I need to bear in mind that websites sometimes die. I don't know if you've been online, but it doesn't, just, like, it doesn't look the same that it did five years ago. I pro you probably don't visit the same sites that you even visited a year ago. Um, second books don't become third books. Speaking gigs dry up, so I need to also think about a lot of the income I make is as a contractor. I have to pay taxes on my own out of it, and I have to think about, okay, you know, I don't have a contributing 401k. I don't have, you know, I'm paying for my own health insurance. All these things are a factor. How do I set myself up to not be a completely burned out, like, 32-year-old in a couple of years who has... Still paying for their own health insurance. Say 32 insurance. like it's old again, Mallory. I do just, it one no, more time. I don't, I, I, I don't mean that at all. I mean, three years from now, I'll be 32. I don't want to be an exhausted 32-year-old with no plan because that's a rough place. It's bad. It would be bad now at 29, but I mean, I'm trying to think about I would like to be a writer for my life if possible, and I need to do that in a way where I'm not running myself into the ground. The idea that because last year you made $25,000 and this year you made $50,000 that that's what your career looks like. Yeah, like next that. year it'll be 150 yeah. and then 300. And when in fact, <laughs> a career is not a line. It, it is kind of a mess. Yeah. And things that you think are, are stable are things you're going to have to completely reconceive of in a couple of years. And other things are going to come out of nowhere and surprise you at different times. Right. And I say this constantly, right? Like, oh. Like, I work at a tech company right now. My next job might be at a nonprofit. That seems very feasible given what I do. And, like, I don't, people talk about taking a pay cut like it's the worst thing in the universe, but like it, being in jobs or why did it just get so loud? Being in jobs or artistic pursuits that you find satisfying and also being able to like generally feed and clothe yourself and your family, that's pretty good. <laughs> like whatever that exactly looks like, I don't think any of us like really want more than that. I've never drawn a salary at the Toast, so I've been here for three years. I'm still doing it for free. Um, I've probably. So <laughs> I would say that um, I've probably put two hundred thousand dollars into the toast, mm -hmm. all in. Which oh, we're getting real. Unless we sell, I'll never get back. Right? Like that's. If anyone would like to buy the toast, <laughs> <laughs> please see Nicole and myself after the show. <laughs> so uh, you know, we talked very early on, and we were accurate. We're like, you know, the toast makes money, and that's true. Like every month, the toast covers its bills. So we pay out our editorial, we pay our freelancers, um, we pay the servers. We have much better servers now than we did the first year, which is why the site doesn't crash constantly. Um, and you can read it on a phone. Yeah, we got that really fancy redesign, which cost a fortune and made no money. <laughs> did not make money. Um, the, it looks great, though. It looks so beautiful. No, I, I have. No regrets. It looks gorgeous. And all of us who read stories on our phones really appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. I remember I used to, to have to, you know, I used to turn my phone and then like, like, to try to like see the I use that tip button, button sometimes. We spend a lot count? of money to stop that, so <laughs> you're welcome. There's a tip button at the bottom of every article. I have, I have hit it. I use the tip button. That's two. <laughs> it's not like... You know, I encourage people to stop using ad blockers. I totally understand that people use ad blockers, but they are the death knell of our industry. Until we did the redesign, I was using an ad blocker <laughs> on our website, and it came up during a meeting. I didn't know that they weren't using them, too. <laughs> I forgot we need apps to live. <laughs> so I get it. Like, but this is the thing. A, a site can make uh, money every month and be able to pay for things. So for, you know, the fact that I don't draw a salary meant that we were able to hire Nikki, Nikki Chung, who's amazing, and pay her a salary, um, and she does great work for the site. Um, the costs that get you in independent web publishing are one-offs that just come up out of nowhere. So there's your initial startup money, um, but then there are things like, well, it was New Year's Day, and I woke up, and my bank, I had a text message from uh, our bank account saying that we were overdrawn on the toast. I'm like, that's weird. And then I look, and apparently our accountant had paid a $12,000 tax bill on our behalf without checking with me first. We did not have $12,000 in our bank account. So the government got their money, but I, like in my jammies, New Year's Day, got to drive to my bank and like give them $20,000 of my own money to put into the bank. Now, obviously, the elephant in the room there is why does Nicole have money <laughs> to throw at the toast constantly? That was the hedge fund part. So, you know. Quantitative finance would be the answer to that question. That's part of what's been great and enabled the toast to live, but it's also reality as we think about, you know, someday as we step back from the site, who do we hand it off to in such a way that's not like, by the way, you're going to need to be the kind of person who on a moment's notice can drop $20,000 into account. That's a lot to ask of someone. 
Um, or, or to ask of somebody else, hey, are you cool writing three to four posts a day that bring in like several million page views a month? That, that part's me. I don't have any money. Um, but you're now. very talented. I have, I have a home. Just that. <laughs> I can afford to pay for my tags this year. I did it six months late, but I did it. I just wanted to point out that the, the structure that you just described is also basically life. Like, you can be bringing in enough money to pay your bills and everything's oh, fine. Shit, so and then there's the question of, like, if you break your leg, if your kid needs braces, you if your mom insurance. loses her house. But it's not just health, right? Yeah, it's all, yeah. But that's what I'm saying is, like, I think about that all the time. Like, we're, sometimes I'm in a place where I'm making enough money to cover everything totally fine now, but what about your oh fuck fund? Yeah. Right? Like, and that's basically what you're talking about. The toast is profitable, but sometimes it needs an oh fuck fund. I feel like a lot of the businesses we're talking about too, Housing Works is one, Electric Literature is another, are run as nonprofits and depend on like people hustling for grants, people hustling for donors, like trying to find people who are extraordinarily passionate about the things that we are passionate about in yeah. order to fund what we do, you know? Um, and even the people who are operating at, um, at, as a for-profit business are doing the living hell out of it all day long, I think. I mean, how many paintings have you captured? All of them. <laughs> we are definitely close to wrapping up with Western Europe. <laughs> we are. There's a whole world out there, though. Yeah. But I think this speaks to a larger point about independent publishing, which I've tried to be um, very transparent about um, on social media and elsewhere, which is that you have to have a bailout, right? And so there, you know, in our case, that's me. Um, and in other sites, that's that they're a remora on a much larger thing, um, which is often a great idea. <laughs> Uh, so um, I've had a lot of readers and people email me and say, hey, can I pick your brain about starting a website? I'm like, oh, please, <laughs> call me right now. And uh, the first thing I say is like, is there a company that will underwrite you for this so that you're generating content, but you're hooked into their existing accounting structure, um, their existing legal representation, ad, um, network. ad networks, all of that stuff? Because if that's the case, um, you are going to be in a much, much better situation. Does anyone want to ask our guests a couple of uh, questions? Yeah. When you were doing entrepreneurial things, did you have any mentors? Anyone else around you that had done that before? Uh, no, I was making it up. Definitely, I was making it up as it went along. Um, I do have, I have a, an older cousin who yells about networking a lot, and she's completely right. Um, it is how everyone gets all jobs they've ever had, which is a really bad system. Jobs.com. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That. Um, I would say that I think about this more from the opposite perspective, which is that I really do try to be a good resource um, for readers and people in the community who want that sort of advice from me. And I think if you can uh, give an hour of your time to have a phone conversation with someone about this process, like that's a great if you can do it. Um, I certainly would have loved, in retrospect, to have spoken to someone who knew what the hell they were doing. Yeah. It must have helped to edit another site first, no? Um, Not know, for the business side? I didn't do, that's, this is something else uh, Mallory and I have talked about when we talk about burnout, which is that um, Mallory is burnt out because she writes constantly, or is approaching Close to, let's be clear, like, I'm okay. She's Nobody, doing, like, worry about me. She's putting <laughs> lipstick on, she looks great. Um, I have just gradually, over time, as the site has gotten bigger, um, I've just moved into a place where I'm doing all of the random businessy administration stuff, which is not what lights a fire in my belly. You know, like I've had to step back from writing to do more of things that don't, just don't motivate me mm -hmm. in the same way. Um, but that's also been a great challenge, you know. Like uh, I remember when we were doing the redesign, I would be on the phone calls with the team. And remember that first day, I was like, I sounded really smart. <laughs> like I was just talking very... She did. About the front end, the back end, rev flow, how the first quarter is usually lower. And I'm like, I have become a woman. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Please email me and I'll be happy to talk to you and be a resource for you at any point. If I may flip side that just real quick. Um, I don't know if it's because I live in New York or because I work at Tumblr or what, but I get asked for phone calls and coffees like 17 times a day. Um, and like... There's totally nothing wrong with that, but when you approach somebody that you want to talk with, know what you want from them, mm -hmm. know what special expertise they have that you think they can you can you can use and why you want to talk to that person, not just like you seem like you have something good. Um, 
don't come at them like, I will buy you a coffee. <laughs> like, the, the number of people who come at me, like, I'm going to be dazzled by their offer instead of, like, I know stuff about what you do. Here's what I do. Here's why I think that it would be great to talk. I'd really appreciate it. But do all that in, like, four sentences. Um, that's my best advice for asking people. And then, like, I think we're all, like, super happy to do it. Um, yeah, I think mentorship is... I wish it was, like, an easier thing for women. I don't think, like, it's a, an, as easy a thing for women to, like, engage in. I don't know why I feel like it's gendered, but just based on the experiences of my male colleagues and based on mine, I think it's, like, definitely. So, I mean, I get a number of emails just from undergraduates asking for advice, and it's not even usually about, it's not that I get frustrated they're trying to dazzle me, it's just that it's, like, a very thinly veiled kind of, like, can you get me a job? Mm -hmm. And, like, yes. Which, just to make you guys feel better, I totally did during that year. <laughs> And I did it just like you said. I was just like, anybody that I could like lash out at was like, you have a job. You seem employed. Can you just, can I just absorb that for Right, I would have ignored her uh, it, it just, it hurt. It hurt. It was physically painful. I was like, I can't be unemployed another minute. Please just stand near me and look employable. There are, I think there are a lot of uh, us who feel like Liz Lemons, like desperately wanting a Jack Donaghy figure. In your life, and sometimes you just have to fake it until you are Jack Donaghy. Yeah, Donaghy. yeah that's what I was Donaghy. gonna say actually. That like for me, mentorship like your own shoes. <laughs> I don't so much have like senior people I look up to so much as I have like amazing peers. I have like a group of women who do like internet book things, including Halima and Steph Opitz, who runs the Texas Book Festival, and Amanda Bullock, who runs Wordstock, and Maris Kreisman, who does kind of my job at Kickstarter, and like. It's G-chat, basically. Like, when I need to do something at work and all the people I work with are engineers and can't give me good advice, it's this sort of group of, like, peer mentorship that I, like, hop in a group email or a G-chat and get amazing advice from, like, the most brilliant women in the world. So, And I, I do think that's, like, a new thing to evolve as publishing has gone digital because, like, that just didn't exist. I don't totally. Think. Oh, yeah, it's G-chat. I mean, because and also the people in this room, like, they don't remember... They're blah. Mentorship doesn't have to come from someone who's like already made it. Like in 10 years, the people in this room will be like everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so building those connections now um, is only going to be valuable. This is also how uh, mostly women in the industry uh, warn each other about other people, you know, um, who are not trustworthy. This is, uh, it's an informal network in that respect. Which and is, all of my DMs are. Oh, absolutely. No, there's very much that. If they'll see you uh, conversing with someone on Twitter, they're like, oh, by the way. And that's very useful information, which otherwise might not have been uh, available to you in that way. <laughs>